How did the best machine learning practitioners get involved in the field? What challenges have they faced? What has helped them flourish? Let's ask them. Welcome to Learning from Machine Learning. I'm your host, Seth Levine. Welcome. I have the honor of having Niels Reimers on the show today, uh, the director of machine learning at Cohere, former researcher at Hugging Face, uh, the creator of Sentence Transformers, and researcher on dozens of papers in NLP. Uh, welcome to the show. Great. Yeah, really happy to be here. Uh, why don't we start off, uh, just give us, give us some background on your career journey. Uh, how'd you get to where you are today? Yeah, so it actually started, I would say, it started a long time ago. So I first trained the first neural network in the early 2000s. So at that time, I was playing with like this Lego, I don't know, these Lego robots you can build. And so I thought, okay, maybe it's something cool to, to add some artificial intelligence to the robot and control the robot with a neural network. And yeah, this, this was like kind of toy example in the early 2000s before, I don't know, AI was in the media or in the hype. And then another key point was like in 20, uh, 2009, I had a great lecture in Berkeley, Introduction to AI, so a super awesome professor who was introducing the concepts was like Pac-Man. So... Um, every concept he presented, it started with like some A star algorithms to find the shortest distance between like two points, which you use like for root planning. And then showed this, how can you do it with like pac -Man? or reinforcement learning? How can you do it with pac -Man? How can your pac -Man become smarter? How can your ghost become smarter? And had a lot of challenges, playful way. It was like super amazing to do this. But then, yeah, sadly, I did not went directly into machine learning AI. I first did like a detour in information security. So I did a master degree on information security. But then after the master degree, I said, okay, I want to go back to artificial intelligence, machine learning, and started to do my PhD in that field. Very cool. Um, so what was it that you initially, you know, figured out like that machine learning is, is something different and it, it's something powerful? I mean, it was super fun in the beginning. So it was like super fun to watch your Pac-Man and try to build it smarter. And it was like really stupid in the beginning. So like you see, okay, your Pac-Man was hunted by the ghost and then it does the wrong turn. So it goes to the left instead of like to a dead end into the trap to the left instead of going to victory or take the right turn. Like yelled at the machine and say, why do you take a left turn? Why did you don't go to the right? Why are you so stupid? And then, why is it so hard to, to make you smart? And so it was like extremely play, play, playful and triggered your like ambition. So you want to say, okay, I want to make it better and better and better. And it was every iteration it got better and it was like fun to create. And then, yeah, after the master degree, I said, okay, it's it's super powerful things you can build. And at that time, I said, okay, language is extremely, has a lot of potential because so much information is stored in, in language. So either a spoken language or written language like text. And if a machine can understand text, can understand what's written in Wikipedia and all the books, all the news articles everywhere and everything, if a really machine cannot understand this, this will give you like an extremely powerful machine. So Pac-Man was nice and fun, but at the end, a smart Pac-Man can just win the game. But if you have a nice and fun Pac-Man that can read text and can produce text, that's super amazing and super powerful. And that's what got me interested in 2013. Awesome. What was one of your first major projects uh, in natural language processing? Yes, yeah, so um, at that time, LP was completely different field. So, so my professor, Irina Gurovich, while I started my PhD, she heard a lot of buzz uh, from the computer vision domain about neural networks. So, so neural networks had a lot of hype a really long time ago, like in the 50s and 60s and 70s. Uh, like half a century ago, people were extremely excited about neural networks, but it didn't work out and, and people said, no, neural networks, that's not working. That's like bad technology and, and you shouldn't use it. And I, I don't know, I, I know some colleagues who talked to Hinton in the early 2000s and, 
and he t- start, started to talk about neural networks again and they were like oh please stop about this boring <laughs> topic i don't want to learn anything about neural networks it's bad technology why are you still doing that and yeah, in 2012 there was like the ImageNet moment where neural network from Hinton was so much better um, on on ImageNet in recognizing images than any system seen before. That computer vision was extremely excited about neural networks again. And then my professor asked me in 2013, hey, is neural network something that might be relevant for NLP? So in NLP at that time, we were still using naive base support vector machines back of words, TF-IDF, these types of features and stuff. And and yeah, my first task and or the whole task for my PhD was figure out will neural networks have an impact on NLP and what type of impact will they have? And and the first project was named entity recognition. Given a text, can I rec- uh, identify named entities like company names, company names, person names in this? And yeah, but more more generally, it was like neural networks. How will they change NLP and how we do machine learning? Awesome. Um, having the creator of Sentence Transformers, um, I would love to dive into it with you. Uh, can you explain, you know, what what is Sentence Transformers? What was its original goal, and why is it so powerful? Yes, yeah, so Sentence Transformers is an open source library which takes text um, into a vector space. Uh, it sounds a bit abstract. So for us humans, when we read text, we can make sense of the text. But for computers, it's like really, really hard to, if they just look at the text, just read the text to really make a sense. So they don't understand the words, how the words are connected. So for example, the word hotel and motel, it's like, these these things are really similar but from a computer perspective these are two different tokens two different words and the computer doesn't know like how are these two words connected what are concepts are they similar dissimilar and so on and so what we do is like take the text written by humans and transform it to a representation that's understandable to a computer and here vector spaces are extremely powerful and then in these, these vector spaces, we can uh, embed, encode relationships of words. So like hotel and motel, yeah, both are, it's a place, a physical place, which has rooms where you can go and stay overnight, which have a reception where you pay money to, to stay overnight. And you can encode the, all this information we have into the vector space so that the computer can start to reason about the text, like really understand the text. And, and so yes. the, the, yeah, so so the, the text embeddings are basically um, taking the text and converting it into a numerical representation, um, and then you can sort of do operations with the text. Can, can you speak to that? Correct. So so it encodes all these information we have on text to uh, all the the information the semantics of a text makes it accessible to the computer. And then you have certain dimensions, certain directions. So for example, you have singular and plural worlds. Um, You have like, for example, I don't know, gender, you know, king is connected to male and queen is connected to female. You know, the relationship between London and England, that London is the capital of England. And then, you know, okay, what's the capital of Germany? And then you can take the same uh, relationship the same direction in the vector space to infer okay the, the capital of Germany is Berlin and then the user can uh, the computer can learn from all these encoded relationships of words and sentences and phrases and paragraphs and infer meaning like okay in which direction and how do I talk about like singular and plurals synonyms relationships like capital politicians companies and relationship to founders Basically, you encode all these relationships you kind of have about the world into the vector space to enable an efficient access um, of the computer to this to the information in the text. What do you view as the the biggest jumps in text embedding from you know bag of words to word to vec to to where we are today? Um. Yeah. So so the first big splash, which caused a lot of interest was like word to vec so so before that 
um, you represented um, text as yeah as, as like unique tokens like 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 one like hot encoding one hot encoding there was like no relationship so the, the distance between hotel and motel and the distance between hotel and dock was the same so the, so for a computer it was like impossible to know that motel is probably more similar to hotel than dock to hotel and then word to vec they enabled this on a word level so it had like a really cool paper showcase that you can encode this uh, and on, on a word level and then second big splash was in 2017 18 like elmo was was contextualized word embeddings so so the issue with word to vec is that it's on a word level so it knows okay hotel and motel are close by and apple and banana and strawberry has certain relationships but we use words in an big setting, like the word apple, I can refer to the food, or I can refer to the company, or I can refer probably to some movie or song or some podcast series or some website. Right. So, so how do you know what Apple stands for in this context? So when I say Apple is a great company, I probably talk about the company. If I say Apple is my favorite food, I talk about the food. And yeah, Elmo was like the first way to show that you can compute contextualized word embedding, meaning the model learns do you talk about the company Apple or about the food Apple or some other meaning of Apple. And this enables like, yeah, more complex, better understanding of how the words are used. And then on top of that, we started to, to build like understanding of sentences and then understanding of paragraphs. Right. So yeah, so the other ones that I that I view as like really big um, stepping stones are like top to vec, um, you know, th things like that. Just being able to represent either words, sentences, you know, full full documents um, numerically, and then being able to sort of do these operations. So creating powerful text embeddings is obviously something interesting for people in the NLP field. But, you know, so what? Uh, you know, why, why should businesses care? Why should people outside of NLP care? So, yeah, my favorite application here is Search. So, so far, Search, it's horrible. Like, like a lot of applications, if you exclude, like, Google and Bing and so on. So, for example, if you go on Wikipedia and hit that search bar and ask question, what's the capital of the United States? First entry, first search result is about capital punishment in the U.S., um, the article about Washington DC is not seen in the top 20 search results. And yeah, that's like completely failed. So, so even such the search query is simple, does not retrieve any relevant results. Because Wikipedia right now, and my, like most other search systems in the world, um, use lexical search where the model, the system has no understanding of the text. So it has no understanding that capital of the United States it's connected to Washington DC. So it has like no idea that, that there's a relationship to this and Washington DC, because if you look at the surface level, just at the characters, it's different. Like capital of the United States and Washington DC, that's, that's different. And with embeddings, we have these relationships built in. So, so the vector space knows that Washington DC and capital of the United States is connected. And also that United States and US and USA are connected. So it can retrieve extremely good search results. Also, these embeddings, they make classification much nicer. So, so I build a system to filter spam unwanted content from an email inbox. I got like a lot of cold emails from people trying to sell me stuff or headhunter trying to send me CVs where I say, no, please move it to away from my inbox. And yeah, with, with these embedded approaches, I can say here like five examples of unwanted emails and now it works extremely well and filters out all the unwanted emails uh, just by providing these five examples because it learned what do I don't want to see. I don't want to have like any cold, cold calls, cold emails from people trying to send me stuff. So please filter that out. We have five examples how such a cold call email looks like and then it learns it and it knows and can generalize to other content in the field. 
Right. So embeddings are sort of the the first step. Um, you know, you're going to take a text and then you you represent it, and then you can start to do um, you know similarity tasks, which allow you to do search better, um, information retrieval, uh, text classification, um, and as you were referring to, there's different uh, techniques to do search. Um, so lexical search is that that's more where you're just looking for exact matches, right? And then neural search is where you get to use sort of the power of, you know, text text embeddings. Um, are there any applications where neural search, there's some limit, where there are limitations for neural search? Um, yeah, of course. I mean, there's always like pros and cons. Um, obviously, like neural search, I mean, neural search is like a really broad topic. Uh, it's not only on embeddings, it's like, I don't know, probably 20 different techniques. Yeah. how you can use these technologies to improve search results. These embedding approaches itself, they have challenges if you want to do like lexical search. So I don't know, if you search for like a phone number, you want to find that entry with this specific phone number. And there's not like a lot of semantic meaning in a phone number. So you cannot infer, hey, at position five, there's a seven. You cannot say, okay, there's like a lot of meaning. Or if these two positions are off by one number, that's a completely different phone number. So, so this is like a limitation. These approaches, obviously, they have challenges um, understanding new words and learning these concepts of new words. So, so we constantly innovate new companies, new products, new movies are released, new people become known. So, so big question in the field is like, how can these model learn these new concepts and the relationships of these new concepts. Yeah. So just just digging into uh, sentence transformers, you know, seeing that it has like nine thousand plus stars on GitHub and twenty five million plus uh, installations. Um, how has the package changed over time? Uh, what's been your experience with open source? Mm -hmm. Can you speak to that? Yeah. Sure. Um, so yeah, originally what a lot of researchers do in the field, they, they do some research and then they mainly publish the code to reproduce their research. Um, say, hey, here's my paper and here's some code you can run to get like the same numbers. There's like a lot of understanding in the machine learning research community, um, which in my opinion limits the usefulness for, for um, the software. I mean, you build amazing models, amazing tools, um, but other people do not really want to use your tool to get the same numbers. I mean, it's kind of boring as an output to say, yeah, at the end it prints out 82.5 and that's the same number I put in my paper, but they want to take your software and build a cool tool. They want to do a semantic search on Wikipedia or do a semantic search on the emails or do a semantic search on notes or do a semantic search on podcast transcript. So this changed a lot. So in the beginning, I was similar, say, okay, mainly publishing code just to reproduce the experiments and results from the paper to more, no, no, let's let's make a product out of it. So what's a cool tool coming from research which allows other people to build cool, cool product and cool use cases out of this? And that's then the main thing I did in the past years in all the research, say, okay, do some research. How can we enable X? And then if we found a way for this, build a product, like a source product, and give it to people to use it to build other cool stuff. Over the three plus years, um, you know, having that library, wh what are some of the biggest challenges that you faced? Um, I mean, as a researcher, you mainly often judge our main criterion is like the number of research you put out, like how many papers do you publish, what are your significant contributions. If you publish and maintain like an open source library, there's like, you have to do work in terms of maintenance, update it, update it to the most, most, most recent version of Python or dependencies, do some <laughs> bug fixing because someone wants to use it on the MacBook. And right. this takes time away from you doing research. And so if it can happen that you do all these work, which is amazing for the community, but you don't have any time more to do research and contribute and improve like human knowledge. 
And so you have to find like the right balance. Right. Yeah. So, so finding that balance between having a library that's useful for as many people as possible, where they can use it as like a huge building block for their work. And then also you want to be continuing to push your, your limits and continuing to expand the, the work that, that you're doing. Um, one of the most exciting, for me at least, use cases of sentence transformers uh, is, is set fit. Um, I see that you know you you were an author on that paper with some people from Intel and and Hugging Face. Can you talk about the experience of um, creating SetFit or helping? Yeah, sure. Um, so in 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 OpenAI when they published GPT three, they had like um, a paper showing that these large generative models are extremely good in few shot classification and it started a lot of hype. So if you write the right prompt, you can classify if a news article is about, I don't know, sports or business or technology. And they show, okay, you only need like really few, few examples here. So you show them all like three examples about sports news articles, three examples about business and three examples about technology. And then for a new article, the, the model can infer the, the category. But if you really use this, it becomes like cumbersome to you. So you have to do like people invented the term prompt engineering because it makes difference. If you add like a colon or a semicolon or an exclamation mark at the end of the prompt, sometimes it's helpful if you ask like, please classify this article instead of classify this article. Or so, so it becomes like really, really cumbersome, really hard to use from, from a user perspective. And then last year, Moshe from Intel AI said, okay, I think with embeddings, this is much easier. Just just take the examples, take your three examples of tech news, business news, and sports news embedded in a vector space and try and classify on the vector space to see where in the vector space are tech articles, business articles, and, and uh, sports articles. And assuming the model has or the vector space has learned all these relationships about sports and players in sports and players in, in technology and players in politics and people in politics use this for future classification and yeah we, we, what we showed or Moshe showed uh, that he can be much better than GPT-3 in a few shot setting while using like a much smaller model like a model you can run on your phone a model that's like 50,000 times more efficient and faster. And then he approached me and said, hey, Niels, I found this super cool tool, it's super amazing. You want to do research on it? And when we tested it, we were totally amazed because you don't have to do any of these prompt engineering where it makes a difference if you end the prompt with a period or an exclamation mark or a colon. Um, it works really nice. It can scale to any size of training data. It, super efficient it runs yeah on your phone it's better than gpt3 on your phone for text classification it works in a multilingual setting extremely nice so we tested these in context learning examples for different languages we did not find any method for example that worked in japanese so we tried really hard and connected also with native speakers so so the, the girlfriend of one of the co-authors is japanese so really make sure that we got the right Japanese prompt. And if she has some ideas how we can modify the prompts to do classification in Japanese. But yeah, with these embedding approaches, because they are language agnostic or can be language agnostic, it doesn't matter if your examples are in English or German or Japanese or Arabic. So you take like three Japanese news, you say, okay, these three Japanese news are uh, tech, sports, business. And then you try the classifier, and then you have like an extremely powerful few shot classifier system in Japanese. And yeah, we were totally amazed by ease of use because super easy to use and super fast to run. Yeah, I have been using it and I absolutely love it. The, the results that, that you get are incredible. Um, yeah, ease of use is, it's, it's, so, it's like, it's a, it's a pleasure. <laughs> it, it's, really, it's really nice to use. You can run it on, on your laptop. Um, the beauty of it, for me, I, I I think is like the contrastive learning, um, the application there, and that how you can take an embedding, and 
you know, leverage the information that you have, right? That these two samples are similar and these two samples are not, you know, not similar. And then you can use that to create a even better embedding that can help you with whatever your downstream task is, say, you know, text classification. Um, in the in the NLP field, I feel like it's very um, it's very hard to know you know when you're making meaningful progress. Um, I know that you have spent time uh, exploring different sorts of benchmarks. Um, I'd love to just get your your take on it. Um, can you yeah can can you speak to uh, the the big NLP benchmarks, the glues and super glues and all of that? Yeah, sure. So so yeah, machine learning field, NLP field he loves benchmarks. I mean that's totally what people do. Like you, you take a benchmark, you see what's the latest number. Let's say it's eighty four point zero. You try a lot of tricks and then you get like a better number, eighty four point two, and then you think yeah eighty point Point two is higher, larger than eighty four point zero. So you write a paper and say this this is better. But we seldom really ask, is it really better? Is this point two improvement, point one, or one point five point whatever the delta is improvement really really better? And I experienced this with sentence transformers itself, like the original models from the paper in the benchmarks that were used at that time and which were like the, the common standard in the field. Uh, the sentence transformer, the, the first version of the sentence transformer models looked better in all the benchmarks than, for example, Universal Sentence Encoder, which was like one, two years older. Um, but if you really use it for your own application and, and really try to build stuff with it, you often saw, okay, no, Universal Sentence Encoder was at that time much, much better than sentence transformers. And so how can there be such a gap? Like all the benchmarks right. say, yeah, Sentence Transformer, Sentence Bird, Machine One is better than you know also Sentence Encoder. But this got, got me interested, like, okay, how good are our benchmarks? Are we really benchmarking what we want? And how can we create better benchmarks? And sadly, a lot of benchmarks in the field become or are becoming meaningless now. So, so in the beginning, when you publish a benchmark, it's useful, it's it's meaningful. But then over time, the value of the benchmark decreases, and at some point, it has like hits like zero value. So it's it's now nowadays completely useless that you get a new state of the art results on glue, because the benchmark is oversaturated, uh, overfitted. It doesn't really tell. So even if your model is better on the glue benchmark, it doesn't tell anything if the model is really better if people will use it. Right. I, I love the uh, comparison that you made where once a in, a, in a recent talk, you were talking basically about how um, having these benchmarks out and then having all these, you know, hundreds of people trying to work on it to make it better. It's like, you know, you're, you're going to be overfitting on that particular data set. You don't know how it's necessarily going to generalize. And you talked about how it was similar basically to like, you know, p-hacking, right? Like if, if you run a hundred different experiments, yeah, you're going to see that something is, you know, is correlated with something else, but it not doesn't mean it necessarily is a meaningful relationship between the two. Yeah, I mean, if, if we take, for example, glue, um, glue just has like short text classification or text understanding task in it, which is like mostly on a sentence level. So so give, take this, this sentence and tell me is it like positive or ne negative sentiment. And yeah, what people did working on this, they, they found ways how to train models that are better on a glue benchmark. So and now a lot of papers and models reports say, yeah, we just train our pre-trained models on short sequences. So we just pre-train it on like sequences up to, I don't know, 128 word pieces. Because for glue benchmark to work well on glue benchmark, we don't need long text understanding. It's sufficient if the model just understands the sentence. And yeah, it's, it's sufficient for glue. And then people put it out and you, you think, okay, this is a great model, performs well on glue, and you use it for your own application. But sadly, your application is, I don't know, email classification, which is longer than a sentence. And there it works really badly because it was never trained to, to work on like longer text, never tested on longer text. 
right. and and maybe the older model bird which was not overfitted heavily on glue is much much better because it works well for your emails which are longer than a sentence yeah it it reminds me maybe it's like even the same thing um you know how sim how similar the data sets that you work on when you're training and evaluating your model offline and then when you put it into production and you see the real data that it's dealing with and then you realize like oh it's not performing the way that i thought it was but if you look at you know why sometimes it can be fairly clear if you trained it all on short texts then it's not going to work well on long texts yeah. one thing that i find to be really incredible and yeah the data sets that you used to train um sentence transformers the variety of them um you know just can can you can you talk can you talk about that a little bit yeah sure um so yeah the the original sentence transformers model was just trained on like small data set from nli so there's like the standpoint nli data set uh, which is like all everything is like short text really clean nicely written and as mentioned, the original model was not as good as Universal Sentence Encoder. And that was like really bugging me because Universal Sentence Encoder was trained on a lot of Google internal data, like millions, billions of data points from all sources. And But sadly, it was not like publicly available. So it was like Google internal data. So yeah, I, I spent a lot of time for lab on Sentence Transformers to get more and more data and then use more and more iterations, make every data set available to build up like some public open source collection. And so now publicly available, there's like over a billion training pairs available from all places like Stack Overflow, Stack Exchange, Reddit, news articles, duplicate questions, and so on, image captions. And yeah, this, this allows the model to learn more. So not only to learn what are the relationship between two nicely cleanly written sentences? So that's what the first version of Sentence Transformers right. was trained on and sadly evaluated on. But now it was trained on like a whole bunch of text, like really ugly, noisy social media text full of hashtags and emojis. Right. And now the model understands like emojis and hashtags and knows, okay, what, what's the similarity between hashtags and relationship in hashtags? Right. And this gives you a much, much better model. Sadly, sometimes if people use it on, on the old benchmarks, on the nicely, cleanly written text, it doesn't perform as well as models overfitted on these settings. And I say, oh right. no, how is it like a state of the art if it's like two points weaker on this absolutely irrelevant benchmark because we have a big trust in benchmarks and think, okay, this benchmark tells which, what is the best model. Right. It's pretty incredible, um, you know, how text that's in a book compared to text that's, you know, in a social media post compared to text that's in a dialogue, you know, how different they really are. Um, you know, yes, it's all people trying to express themselves, you know, use, using um, using natural language, but there's just such, such a variety. Uh, I think that's what makes it hard to get this one uh, you know, encoder that's going to, you know, wor work for everything. And I think that's why you sort of need to figure out what's the best one, what's the best embedding that's going to be applicable to uh, to your use case. Um, it was so nice to talk to you about, you know, sentence transformers and, and set fit. Um, to zoom out a little bit, um, I, just to talk about machine learning in general. I'm just wondering, in, in the field, uh, what's an important question that you believe remains unanswered? So what amazes me about the human is our ability, how quickly we can learn and update information. So still a big challenge of a lot of models, like if you take the BERT model, BERT still thinks that Barack Obama is the US president has like no idea about Donald Trump, no idea about Joe Biden. And for us as a human to update the knowledge that there's like a new US president, it's easy. It's like one sentence like person X is the new US president. I don't know, Joe Biden is the new US president. And then we have this information in our head, but we also update the relationships. So we know, okay, there's a new US president. We know there's a new first lady. We know maybe the party changes. So before 
was Donald Trump Republican, now it's Joe Biden Democrat. It changes number of presidents who attended different schools, numbers of presidents who have been former vice presidents, and so on. Like a lot of knowledge is updated in our head from this short, I don't know, five word example, like uh, Joe Biden is the new US president. If we do this for, for a model like Word, like some, some transformer model, it's like super, super hard to update it. So often we need like a lot of text, like millions of examples mentioning that Joe Biden is the new US president and now the, the Democrats are back in the White House and that there's a new first lady and so on. So it's like extremely super inefficient. And this makes it like really, really hard to, to have like models up to date, models that you can learn like niche topics because it's not, not data efficient. And I think going forward, that's an extremely interesting uh, research topic. How can we make models update as efficiently as humans can acquire new knowledge? Right. So that ability to adapt to change. Um, and that, that sort of touches on um, my next question, which is how do you think machine learning will change um, or, or evolve, say, in the next... 10 years and what do you think the impact uh will be on society <laughs> big question big question um so currently the trend one we see is we go to more exciting applications which are hard and harder to to quantify like so far, machine learning research is a lot about quantification. So you take a benchmark like Blue, where you have like thousand examples, I don't know, movie reviews, which you annotated as positive or negative sentiment. And that's like really easy to, to benchmark your numbers and say, okay, this model is better than previous models because it got like, I don't know, 95% correct and previous model got 94% correct. With these more complex use cases like generative things like, I don't know, here's an email, write like a nice response to, to that email. Like, how do we evaluate this? Or, I mean, we, we saw these application, ChatGPT, write like a poem, how bubble sort is working. How do you evaluate if the generated poem is correct? So you have to evaluate as the content, does it make sense? How um, amusing it is. How amusing <laughs> is it? Does it rhyme? And this puts like a lot of stress in, in science, like, okay, how can we know these two systems, this system creates like a nicer poem, how bubble sort is working, or is this system working nicer? And I think we're more and more tapping on these use cases. We see now it's possible. But it's interesting how can we create like a science out of this, which requires experiments, and how can we continuously improve on this? And yeah, the, the research field went away in machine learning a lot from human experiments, like asking humans uh, what they think to like pay quantitative numbers, computing accuracy, or F1 scores. I think now it's going back again to human experiments. So we showed 100 humans these two generated uh, poems, which poem is, is nicer, is better, and then try to find these numbers. But yeah. It will be will it be really hard for science how to compare it, how to scale it. So it will be a change how we do scientific stuff. Speaking of uh, chat GPT and, you know, the generative models, you know, I, I see that it's it's creating a big hype, right? Even larger hype for, for AI. H how do you view the gap between the hype uh, and, and the reality right now in machine learning? Uh, yeah, that's that's a good one. Um, so what we're, I mean, it shows that there are a lot of applications possible, which we have not thought before, which which could be possible. I mean, so so I just read like I don't know, really nice cool idea. Um, as as manager or director or whatever, you get like a lot of emails. So you have to respond to a lot of emails uh, and then, yeah, use these generative models to create like a draft for every email you get based on previous responses you sent. You do some post editing and then you can send it around. 
and send it out and this will save you as a manager like a lot of time when your main job is like communication and you don't have to write these draft by hand each time but just from previous what you sent around just take the same text distill it and generate this still a lot of uncertainty unknown in the field is like what's what the right business and that's what people currently try to figure out what's the business model um was similar when when the mobile internet was launched and smartphones was launched like how do you create like a business out of an app so so what's an app business what can be the business model over the past 15 years we learned how you can create like a business model out of apps and i think it's similar with ai now so so what is potential business model for ai for generative things majority of things will not work out but there are some things that work out and then it can be copied over and over again where we say okay that's that's like a new new way how you can use it right with with the um you know advent of generative models and sort of how they're permeating through society it's it's really crossing over that boundary of it's not like a natural language processing thing it's not a machine learning thing it's it's affecting all different types of work. Um, I think it's really how humans interact with those generative models. Like for example, you know, you're, you're talking about like drafting up emails or drafting up, uh, you know, outlines for, for essays. And then, you know, the human can then take that and work it and make it, you know, make it better. It's gonna be really interesting to see sort of how humans and machines how that interaction evolves over the next couple of years when we're in this time where it's like now everyone is sort of seeing the power uh it's going to be interesting to see yeah like all the different applications of it so switching uh into our learning from machine learning um part of the show who are some people in uh, in the field that influence you? Um, yeah, big big impact had like Andrew and G. Um, so he gave like like I don't know like not too long like quite recently maybe like one two years uh, really cool thought provoking talk about data centric AI. Yeah. So so which I totally love like in machine learning people focus a lot on modeling. They say, okay, this is my data set, the MS data set. It's given, it's got given. That's the training set, that's the dev set, that's the test set. I have to get the highest accuracy on the test set given the train and dev set. And and I try to hyper to tune my model as much as possible. But yeah, so, so he argues that working on data is a lot more fruitful. So, so in many settings, in, real cases it's not like okay here's like one test set or one data set where you can train on and one test set you're going to evaluate on and you can modify how the training works you can change the training add features add clean it get more data annotate more data and this this often improves your model a lot and yeah that's that's also what i learned like Okay, it's often not relevant to, to improve the model. So a lot of work I did in the past years is not trying to make the model better and add like another, I don't know, skip connection or the latest Adam, whatever variation there is out there, but find ways how to make the data better. And this paid off a lot for search. So, so we had these initial search models and then we, we found ways how we can make the training data nicer and better and, and work work really well to train these vector spaces and remove bad examples from training examples and that had like massive impact um, so, so if the model is really trained with nice clean data um, it works much much better and then often you can just copy paste the same approaches uh, and just use it with good nice clean data right um yeah it's interesting because when you're learning about data science, I feel like the attractive thing are the algorithms and you want to be modeling things. And you might go to a resource like Kaggle, which is incredible, but you're given, you're handed a data set, right? And it's, it's pretty clean usually. 
that is never the case um, in industry. So I think that that's another part of the data centric, um, you know, ap approach to things, just sort of always making sure that, you know, are you getting the best data that you can? Are you processing it in the right way? Um, and yeah, yeah I, I, I'm definitely a big proponent of that. Yeah, totally. I mean, in, in the talk, Andrew showcases some cases from computer vision where they take a picture to try to detect like defects in manufacturing. So some parts which have like errors. And what they do is like, I don't know, use, use a different camera, set it at a different angle with different light and model accuracy jumps like 20 points. So that's completely right. outside of data pre-processing, feature engineering, models, hyperparameter tuning. But yeah, how you acquire the data had a big impact. Like, okay, use different angle of the camera, different lighting, and now everything, it's super easy to spot these mistakes in the, in the production. And that's nice thinking where you don't think, yeah, like you get the data and then you try to, I don't know, clean the data or tune the model. But yeah, right. even a step before, like how do you acquire the data? Right. Um... Just, yeah, figuring out different ways of, you know, what, what, are, what are the inputs going to be, you know, for, for the model. Uh, that, that's a very interesting way to augment data for computer vision. Um, with so many things going on in machine learning and it being such a rapidly evolving field, how do you stay, you know, up to date with the latest developments and, and techniques in the field? Yeah, that, that's a challenge one. Um, I try, well, I do, do not stress too much about like trying to stay up to date with the latest techniques because a lot of things or majority of things that are published are kind of irrelevant. I mean, that's every month you have like thousands of papers on archive, but only if you do like a retrospect what have been relevant papers last year, you can break it down to 20, maybe 50 papers or so. So, so you don't have to read all the thousands of papers that are uploaded to archive and, and what's relevant will be resurfaced at some form because there's maybe some follow-up paper um, using this old technique because this old technique works well and then you say, okay, cool, there's like some follow-up work. So and yeah, in, in general, what works for me is, is Twitter. So, so see what are people talking about, what are people right. tweeting. Uh, open papers, just read the, I usually just read the title and look at figure one or table one, maybe the abstract and then just get like a gist of like, okay, um, that's, that's could be interesting or feeling. And then over time, maybe at some point you reread some paper and say, oh yeah, there was some old paper that had this cool figure. And then, yeah, sadly back to to a search problem, trying to refine this paper is still really, really challenging. Uh, and it's not a use neural search. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Google, Google search doesn't work that well, where you say, yeah, I read sometime half a year ago, an archive paper, which is nice figure one showing how you can modify kind of, I don't know, momentum in the optimizer. Can you please show me this paper again? It goes back to a prompt, <laughs> prompt engineering, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, many, many people uh, compare search query formulation with prompt engineering. So, so we, I don't know, when Google launched, people didn't know how to use it in the beginning and we had to learn what's the right query to write. And yeah, that's, that's similar with prompt engineering of generative models. Yeah. But oh, prompting Google in the right way can get you pretty far uh, in, in this world right now. Yeah. Um, in uh, in your, your machine learning journey, um, what's what's one piece of advice that you received that has helped you or stuck with you? One piece of advice that stuck with me or helped with me. Sense. The next question is going to be harder. So. Ah, <laughs> the next question going to be harder. Um, yeah, I didn't reflect on that question. Um, <clears throat> So, 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 yeah, I cannot really narrow it down to like single piece of advice. So what I'm more, what I did a lot of in the past years is more be closely connected to the community, see what is 
what are common questions they have where there's no answer for this. So for example, common question after launching sentence transformers, which only work for English, was like, hey, that looks promising. I want to use it for another language. Right. And, and there was like no answer for this. And I got this question over and over and over again and said, oh, yeah, if there's no answer, that's a great research question. Let's do research on this. And so we did cool research. And then another common question was like a lot of people, yeah, I want to use this for, I don't know, searching and CVs. Um, but I don't have any training data. So how can I tune this model with our training data? And answer was then, no, oh, you need training data. It's not possible with our training data. So I started to do a lot of research post last year, how to train models without labeled training data. So, so it's more like be connected to the field, see what are the challenges and yeah, find. Um, that, yeah, that, that's, that's good advice. Um, in the similar vein, someone who is just starting out in data science or machine learning or say is making the transition from another field, what advice would you give them? Um, depends a bit on the role. So if they more go into like a PhD role, research role, or if they more go into like a product role, want to ship a product. Say industry. Say, industry. say they want to go into industry. Let's say go into industry. Um, First, I would say, do not trust everything what you read in papers for both roles. So often the best approaches are not the approaches, the newest approaches, like not try to get like the state of the art approach for whatever problem you try to solve. But the early on approaches are often like, there's often like the first iteration on something like, I don't know, how to generate images and then there's like a second iteration and a third iteration and this is of like the best kind of like model and then at some point people start to overfit on the benchmarks and create like systems that are complex and overfitted and unstable and not robust and not efficient just to beat these benchmarks so i try to find like the sweet spot where we really made progress and then find a solution that's easy and in general yeah, a lot of testing, find ways, quick ways to test your hypothesis. Don't try to be too clever, use simple approaches. And often simple ways, simple approaches brings you a lot further than super complex methods and ways. Yeah, I think that that's really good advice. Start, start with the foundation. Here's the tricky question. Um, what advice would you give yourself um, when you were just starting out in your career? Um, well, that's, that's also a good, good question. Um, Thank you. Yeah, so I would say, yeah, go f early on with like the user-centric research. So I'm, I'm a big fan of user-centric research, which means do research that actually helps people and make really sure to release something that's helpful for others. So, so a lot of researchers including myself in the beginning, were just saying, hey, we, we we just published this paper and the work is done if the paper is accepted at some at some conference. I say, no, that's that's like, I don't know, that's not really the purpose. We want to find a problem that's big and that's, I mean, really challenging in the beginning, beginning to, to find. So partner up with someone experienced to, to see these big problems and then create like a really nice solution for this. And, and do the research, but also make the, the results accessible in a really simple and easy way. I like that. I, I think the way that I view research is basically there's a big puzzle in front of us, right? And you're working on a single puzzle piece sometimes. And I think you can sometimes lose sight of the so what right? Like, so why should, it, why should someone care, you know, outside of, outside of this field? And that can kind of make your work more relatable um, and allow other people in. And that's always, um, that's always a way to sort of enhance, enhance the work that you're doing. Yeah. I mean, accessibility is a big issue in machine learning. So we have so many papers on, for example, optimizers, like, I don't know, every month someone published an optimizer that's, much better than Adam, but 
I don't know, everyone is still using Atom Optimizer, which is already, I don't know, five years old or so, or older? Yeah. No. But probably. There's some funny memes about that, like Adam asking why me or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know how old is Adam. It's oh, it's from 2014, so it's like nine wow. nine years old. So, and the issue is like, yeah, in these nine years, there has been probably hundreds of papers on better optimizers than Adam, but no one is using them. And I think one one big issue is like accessibility. So maybe you have found like a better optimizer than Adam. But they did not make it like accessible, and and if you really wanted to make it accessible, it means to have it like nicely, efficiently implemented and available in like common frameworks like TensorFlow and PyTorch and Jax and integrated in libraries like I don't know, high-end phase transformers. So make it extremely simple to to for people to use it, test it out, and then often you see it if you do it, yeah, it works on these few. Example use cases you tested it, but if you take all the users of I don't know TensorFlow, you will see yeah maybe it doesn't work for ninety eight percent of the users of TensorFlow. It just works for like a tiny slice of users. So then you can do research. Okay, how do you make it more broadly suitable? So how can you increase it, or how can you better predict for which two percent of users is it actually like a benefit to use this new optimizer? For listeners that are just getting involved in machine learning, you know, like, w- w- what is an optimizer? How would you explain that to someone? Uh, sure. Yes. Yeah, so, so optimizer is the fundamental way how we train um, the model. So, so we take a model, give an input, like an email, and then ask the model, hey, do you think this is like a spam email or is it a ham email? And then the model say, no, I think, yeah, that looks legit. You want to buy some medication over the internet? That sounds good. And then you have the label say, no, 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 this is spam. I don't want to see this in my inbox. And then you say, okay, there's like a mismatch. There's difference between what the model predicted and what's the correct answer. And then the optimizer can bring it back to the input, say, okay, which words did you thought um, make it look legit? And how can I modify the weights so that the next time you see this example, the, the email will be correctly classified as a spam email. That's great. Uh, yeah, thank you for that. That's a good explanation for optimizers. Um, so getting to the conclusion, um, what has a career in machine learning taught you about life? <laughs> um career in machine learning taught me about life that's what we're all here for yeah i mean it's more what have life taught me about machine learning that's an easier one you, well you, so, if you want to start with that you can <laughs> yeah uh, um oh yeah what what taught me machine learning about life so so i'm a parent of two two kids like one one now soon like two and four years old and yeah you kind of see it like as your model learning, improving, doing mistakes in the beginning, and then improving, you provide feedback. So you're kind of like the gradient update and optimizer to your kids. <laughs> and it's kind of interesting for me, at least, to, to see the things which are like, like, like what's like similar in machine learning, trying to improve the model, and what's you as a parent try to, to raise your kids and yet yeah, still still amazed by the learning capabilities of humans i mean even in a young age uh, i don't know when they are like two three years old you can invent names so, so you take like some toy or some stuff or some concept and you create like a fake name for it and they can talk use this name and start to reason about the name so if this is called like this invented name then this must be some other invented name it's like extremely interesting how quickly kids pick up language and be able to to draw these conclusions and and reason about this. And yeah, if if you try this even with the smartest GPT chat GPT model and say, hey, please call my car, whatever, call my car, uh, John, it's not really able to learn this and not able to to reason about this. Right. Super interesting. So yeah, thinking of children and how uh, 
reinforcement learning is is influencing their behavior and how they're uh, representing the world around them just like the models you know that that we're trying to train um i'm going to butcher his name but francois chalet uh he um i love some of his tweets he talks about raising children um and how it's like tr like training a machine learning model um that that's that's great that that's such a great um great take on it um so just just to wrap things up if there are listeners that want to learn more about you um where where could they go to to learn more about you yes yeah, so when you google my name you can find my personal website neons-rimos.de um, you can find also my google scholar profile about research and yeah you can also watch cohere.ai about like work we are gonna do like in semantic search and text understanding and bring it to production so it's so really now more focus or i went moved away a bit from research side more to production side so how can we really deploy these systems and face the challenges from nicely clean research benchmarks to okay i actually put it into production and see all the challenges you have with ugly, noisy data in a production setting and, and how can you ensure that your system still work well and nicely in these settings. Right. Um, Niels, it was such a pleasure to have you on uh, Learning from Machine Learning. Thank you so much for being here. Likewise, it was great chatting with you. Thank you for listening to Learning from Machine Learning. This episode featured an expert in natural language processing, Niels Reimers, the creator of Sentence Transformers, and currently the director of machine learning at Cohere. Be sure to check out the show notes to learn more about this podcast and some of the topics discussed. Talk soon, and keep on learning. <laughs>